This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 271, recorded on August 4th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello, hello. Happy August. I don't know how that happened, but it is August. It is. And the football players are probably practicing, right? They started this week. Because I was in Fort Collins, Colorado State, and when I was waiting for my shuttle bus, the, the stadium was right next to me, and all the football mm-hmm. players were out there yeah. yelling and making noise. <laughs> also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Is it really hot there today, Michael? Oh, we have the dog days of summer. We We have absolute humidity. You walk out to take a bath. What is it here? What do we got? You may be warmer than we are. I mean... 33 Celsius. And we are... Let me do the Kathy thing and look at the weather. Uh, (laughs) I know in Ann Arbor it's cool, right? It's always cooler in Ann Arbor. It's 80 degrees. Yeah. Is is it dry there or is it humid, Michelle, mostly? Uh, Today it's humid. I mean, it can vary. Up up north, um, the air is so clear and fresh. It's really lovely. How, How far north is it? Like two hours or so? Um, I go about almost four hours, but wow. north and west. Hmm. That must be nice. Yeah. We are Actually, at 90 degrees, which is... not too bad, but you have a lot of humidity down there, right? Yeah. Because you're right on the water. Yes. <laughs> the sauna. Well, if I ever visit, I want to visit in August. Yes. I just brought my father to his hometown of Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, which is Ooh. way up on the um, border of Canada. So that was interesting to hear him reminisce about his early days. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, today we have uh, two stories for you, and I will start out with our snippet, which is an M-Bio paper. This was originally discovered by Michael, who uh, also made some other suggestions. I thought I would grab this as a snippet. It is a bacteriophage-based, highly efficacious needle and adjuvant-free mucosal COVID-19 vaccine. And the three co-first authors, Jinjian Zhu, Swati Jain, and Jian Sha, last author is Venigala Rao, comes from a number of institutions. Uh, the Catholic University of America, which is in Washington, D.C., University of Texas in Galveston, and Western Kentucky University, Bowling Green, Kentucky. And so this is an experimental uh, COVID vaccine. And as they point out, you know, we have done very well making vaccines, but none of them are needle-free and none of them are mucosal vaccines. So that's one of the uh, challenges they take on here. Can we do both? And in particular, Um, the mucosal immunity is key because um, that will protect a person from shedding it, spreading it to their associates. In theory, yes. And the other attractive pit is it doesn't require a cold chain or refrigeration. That's right. It's, it's very stable. stable. It's very yeah. exciting. I can't wait to hear you describe it. So the um, the platform that they use is bacteriophage T4, uh, the old workhorse of phages. Yes. Well, Michael, you must have worked on T4. At some I point. did. <laughs> I did. When I, when I was working as a graduate student teaching um, high school kids, we actually use did a T4 transduction where we would move genes, and it was really pretty cool. And if you are what well, uh, Vincent behind him has uh, the shape of the T4 bacteriophage mm. as an image behind him, or at least it's an icosahedron. Uh, it's a pillow, you know, it's made with quilting. Yes, <laughs> but the phage looks like a lunar landing module. It does yes. indeed. Yeah. It's the ultimate uh, steampunk virus, right? Yes. <laughs> so uh, T4 phage has been well studied for many years. Of course, we know the structure of it. And the head is a icosahedral structure, which means it's made of a few proteins repeated many times. And so 
they took advantage of that by inserting the spike uh, protein into the, the capsule. They put the gene, of course, into the genome of the virus. And now you have a T4 bacteriophage with the capsid decorated with about 100 copies of spike. And the spike is the prefusion stabilized, made so famous by the mRNA vaccines, where you introduce a few prolines and it, it prevents cleavage, so it maintains a, a, a proper uh, structure to be antigenic. They also put the nucleocapsid protein into the core of the capsid, so they have it packaged in there. Uh, and um, they also have on the surface a, a 12 amino acid peptide from another viral membrane protein, the E protein of SARS-CoV-2. So you have three different proteins there. And of course, this is a symmetrical repeated capsid, right? So all of these proteins are repeated, the, the spike and the E protein are repeated many times, which is probably a good thing for inducing uh, good immune responses. Um, a, a number of other vaccines are, are, are experimental. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines are made using, for example, nanoparticles. We have many copies of the spike protein on the surface, and that seems to be very good at inducing certain kinds of antibodies. So they make this uh, this virus, which they call T4-CoV-2, a nano vaccine, <laughs> mm-hmm. and they they immunize mice. But but to make it, they mm-hmm. grow the phage on E. coli, right. and then do some serious uh, cesium chloride gradient centrifugations. That's so it's right. just, it's classic microbiology. And they use CRISPR, of course, to insert the genes into the phage genome. But then, yeah, they grow it up, they purify it on ce- cesium chloride. I left so many rotors behind. <laughs> nobody wanted them no no one knows what to do with them i gave one to amy i gave her a fixed angle T- ti-75 one of my favorite rot- rotors because you can do gradients you can do cesium gradients you can do other things you can do pelleting but it's really sad that nobody uh, very few people do this kind of biochemistry anymore but we're going to see how useful it is yeah so they mm-hmm. do this they purify the phage and they immunize mice they either give them intramuscular or intranasal doses. They give them two doses uh, and different numbers of particles, and um, then they they assess the immune response uh, three weeks after the last dose. So just remember now, three weeks after the last dose, you still have very high antibody levels in both the serum and the mucosal surfaces. So uh, they have not yet contracted, as as we like to say over on TWIV. Uh, and then they check the antibodies by ELISA. Very high levels of serum IgG, uh, 312,000. That's, that's the dilution you need to do to uh, get the 50% levels. That's high. It's very high. And then uh, they also look at serum IgA. So IgA is a kind of antibody that is typically in mucosal surfaces, but you can find it in serum as well. And there's good titers as well, 62,000. Uh, again, either IM or IN root. And they say this is unusual because we don't normally see IgA stimulation uh, with the current COVID vaccine. So something different is happening here. But interestingly, the IgA occurred with both IM or intranasal in immunization. So obviously the antigen is very important for stimulating IgA, not just spraying it in the nose, in other words. These antibodies were able to neutralize virus infectivity, in other words, block infection of cells and culture. I'm very happy that they use authentic SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> they infect SARS uh, cells and culture. They don't use a pseudotype virus, which mm-hmm. everyone seems to use. I mean, to do SARS-CoV-2, you need a BSL-3. And that's why Galveston was involved here, because they have a BSL-3 laboratory there. For animal studies. Uh, also. And animal studies as well. So they find slightly higher neutralization uh, antibodies in serum after uh, intranasal, but threefold, not really all that, all that big a difference. Um, they, they tested, the, so the virus they used, the spike they used was the ancestral, as we call it, the original isolate way back in the beginning of 2020. They, they test these antibodies against uh, beta and delta variants of concern, and they are, the antibodies are able to neutralize those uh, as well. So you're getting a broadly protective neutralization response. I was very happy to see that they also looked at cellular immunity. Mm-hmm. Yes. Most papers, they do the antibodies and that's the end of the story. And as anyone 
who has studied some immunology might know there's another arm which consists of of T cells and other kinds of cells, but they might mainly look at uh, CD8 and CD4 positive T cells. And what you can, what you have to do, you take the mice day 26 after boost, you, you take out some blood, you get out the lymphocytes, the white blood cells, you put them in culture, and then you add antigen, you add viral antigen and see if they respond. You can add either the S protein or peptides that span the overlapping peptides spanning the entire uh, protein. You add them to the cells in culture. And then if there are T cells that recognize those proteins now, as a consequence of immunization, the T cells will, will go, whoa, I like this. They start making cytokines, which you can measure, uh, like interferon gamma, TNF, and others. And so they can find uh, both CD4, the helper type T cells, and CD8, the cytotoxic T cells. Uh, when Again, when you immunize mice by either a kind of root. And for those of you who may remember your immunology, there are two kinds of cytokines produced by T cells. There's the Th1 and the Th2, which uh, bias towards antibody or cellular responses. Uh, and they find that their immunization gives a good balance of both of these. So it's not skewed in one direction or the other, which is not a good thing to have. You don't want a mm-hmm. skewing of just make antibodies only or just make T cells only. All right. So, um, this, uh, th- they focus now on the intranasal. They're just, they're needle free, right? They're just pipetting it into the nose of mice. And if this ever made it into people, they would give it to you like you would get uh, flu mist. If you've ever had the influenza vaccine, which is sprayed into your Squirt nose. Your with nose. A, mm-hmm. They squirt it in your nose with a needleless syringe. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, and the mice, of course, they pipette it in, but they wouldn't pipette it into humans. Um, <laughs> but, um, these antibodies induce very high uh, mucosal IgG and secretory IgA. So secretory IgA is the the mucosal antibody, but you can also get IgG there as well. And of course, that's why uh, our vaccines work. Even though they're given intramuscularly, they give rise to IgG in the serum, which can then get across into mucosal layers. Uh, and they find that uh, in, in their case, they do get mucosal IgG and IgA responses after uh, immunization, but intramuscularly uh, does not give secreted IgA. And that's probably expected, you know, in the, it's mainly the IgG that is going across into the mucosal layers and protecting you after an injection uh, into your muscle. They do some challenge studies next. They have mice that have been immunized. They challenge them with a mouse adapted strain of SARS-CoV-2, which uh, we talked about many, many moons ago on TWIV. Uh, the, the vector immunized mice, they have weight loss and the ones immunized with the T4 CoV-2 vaccine, uh, modest or no weight loss. In wild type mice infected with that mouse adapted strain, that's, that's the best you can do. It's not a lethal infection. Mm-hmm. You do get some lung pathology uh, and in fact, they look in in the lung and, and see less pathology in the lungs of immunized mice. There's less, in fact, there's no infectious virus in the in the lungs of mice immunized with the vaccine. Undetectable. Either undetectable. And they do a plaque assay, which I'm very happy about, as you may know. Yes. <laughs> Either intramuscular or intranasal immunization. And they say... This indicates that the vaccine might be inducing sterilizing immunity, hence minimizing virus shedding. However, I would caution the authors that it's only 21 days after the second dose. And we know antibody levels will slowly decline. And by six months, at least in people, there there are very, very low antibody levels, in which case it may not be sterilizing. So I think they, they should have done a longer term experiment to see if, in fact, this these levels endure. I doubt they would, but I suspect there would be uh, immune memory in the form of B cells uh, and T cells. They, they probably didn't have the money to carry the animals and the level three facility for that length of time because the per diem rate is probably pretty steep. Well, you can immunize in a BSL, ABSL2, leave them there for a while, and then bring them into the three for challenge. Challenge, right? yeah. Then you can leave some outside longer and then bring them in for challenge. But yeah. Uh, but to the author's credit, they packed a lot of analysis into oh. this one paper. <laughs> so there's a lot, lot of analysis. Got to draw the line sure. somewhere. <laughs> no, no, I understand. But they shouldn't say it could be uh, sterilizing because 
Well, it, they said it potentially. It could be. They didn't say it is. Could so, It could yeah. block, yeah. Yeah, I thought they were very honest in their interpretation. They also uh, make a beta variant spike vaccine because at the time they were doing this work, the beta variant was uh, arising in many countries. And so they do the same experiments. They immunize with that. They show that you get good uh, antibody and cellular responses uh, and they do challenge and they find that uh, immunization with um, the beta T4 CoV-2 beta vaccine gives protection against Delta as well as the original SARS-CoV-2 in terms of uh, uh, of uh, weight loss. They also use a, um, a different mouse model, which is a, a, a mouse that is transgenic for the human ACE2 gene under the control of a, of a very strong promoter. And those mice actually die after infection, but the vaccine gives 100% survival. And, uh, and just, just to remind um, listeners that ACE2 protein from humans is what is, acts as a receptor for the SARS-CoV-2. So these That's mice, right. unfortunately, are much more vulnerable because they've got, they're loaded with the receptor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they have human receptor, which... Uh, is very effective at taking up virus, yeah. So that's a very uh, stringent model. In other words, mm-hmm. you get death. You, the vaccine prevents death. It's doing pretty well. Uh, and then, um, as Michael mentioned earlier, they, they looked at stability. You know, w- what will this – and they say FT4 is a gut resident, right? So the capsid is very stable. It's pretty hostile down there. 37 so, degrees, uh, acid, yeah. Yeah. acid, enzymes. So they, they incubate the vaccine preparations at – either 4 degrees Celsius or 22 degrees Celsius, roughly room temperature. And they take samples and, and assay for uh, stability and ability to bind a receptor and um, completely stable for at least 10 weeks at either temperature. That's mm-hmm. great. A fantastic result. That's very good. Well, what really um, excited me is the possibility. I mean, granted, we need a a – great SARS vaccine for the developing world that doesn't necessarily need a cold chain or any of those other issues with vaccines. But imagine if we can use CRISPR technology to put other antigens into bacteriophage that will have the same level of effectiveness. Now that SARS-CoV-2 has pointed the way to think about mRNA technology and getting it expressed, why not use bacteriophage? Yeah, to do it. Yeah. Now, now, Michael, would you be worried that the phage might alter the microbiome of the injected mm. animal? Let's look uh, at that. Let's look at that in some detail. <laughs> and so they asked that question because these are phages that can infect E. coli, right? That is indeed correct. And so they did uh, look at. Uh, we sort of te- we sort of teed this up for Vincent. <laughs> microbiome community, whether the vaccination impacts the microbiome community. So they take DNA from fecal feces of mice and they sequence the 16S ribosomal RNA gene and take a look. Um, and they do a number of different kinds of analyses of the data. And intramuscular inoculation doesn't seem to Sorry, intranasal inoculation doesn't seem to alter the gut microbiome, but intramuscular inoculation does. Um, They say it has a significant impact on the gut microbiota, and giving it intranasally doesn't have this issue. So whether it's an issue or not, biologically, we don't know, but um, the intranasal doesn't have it, which is a good news, right? Although the authors are interested in looking at the um, more limited microbiome in the respiratory tract and the lung yeah. to see if after intranasal immunization, there might be an effect right. there. So to their credit, they're thinking about that. So this is a promising uh, backbone, I think. And it's it's a repeated structure, which is very nice. And it is stable, uh, No, at least no side effects in mice. And uh, they have to, of course, test more animals. They need to go into hamsters and macaques. They have to do a phase one uh, human clinical trial. So they need to attract some substantial funding in order to do that. They say the efforts are underway. And so I hope that uh, we see more of this. And I think in general, it might be a nice platform for vaccines. Uh, we, we had a twiv with Pamela Bjorkman, who described a uh, mosaic nanoparticle SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, where she put eight different spike proteins on the particle. And so that 
when when injected into um, mice, gave rise to very broadly neutralizing antibodies that would neutralize any any beta coronavirus that they threw at it. And so the uh, the what was the key there is making this mosaic structure. So mm-hmm. uh, no one antibody can cross link two spike proteins. And so you could do a similar thing with uh, FHT4. It may be cheaper than making a mosaic nanoparticle. Yeah. Mm. So you let I think, the phage do the chemistry. You let the phage yeah. take care of it. So they've I think optimized it's got some it over. Broad, yeah. Millennia. Uh, millennia. They also point out that um, the literature is full of. Um, human clinical trials, and they say hundreds of T4 phage vaccine immunizations in mice, in rats, in rabbits, in macaque animal models with a variety of antigens, and they have yet to see any significant side effects from the T4 phage. So yes, they need to do those studies with this particular vaccine, but there's reason to be um, optimistic that this will be safe. So we will see where where these studies proceed. They have to... uh get past the phase one showing in people it's safe and then phase two and three showing it can modify infection and uh, there will always be SARS-CoV-2 around so we don't have to worry about that <laughs> not going that anywhere. is true not going anywhere okay there you go and, and, and now so uh, I'll cheap, hand it over to Mike cheap shelf stable easy to engineer and looks like it's going to um, not only protect the person who's vaccinated, but also prevent them from shedding and infecting Maybe, other yeah. people. It ticks all the right boxes. Yeah. I, I think it won't prevent shedding, but it'll decrease it like the other decrease vaccines. It, sure. And yeah. maybe below the threshold required to spread as maybe. easily. Yeah. To be, to be determined. But they made the mistake of using the scary phrase sterilizing immunity. So we're going to have to play whack-a-mole with the press saying it will not sterilize people. <laughs> yes, that's true. Not a good word, right? Uh, yeah. It, it's unfortunate that the press doesn't understand the nuance. As a microbiologist, I'm just, I feel so much pride that they're taking advantage of just classic knowledge of bacteria, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. E. coli, and of course, a solid knowledge of immunology um, yep. to address what remains a global health problem. So thank you. This is a great, great step. All right. Now on to something a little bit different. Um, this paper uh, also appeared in MBio, and it's entitled The Gut Bacterial Community Potentiates Clostridioides Difficile Infection Severity. And it's from a group of authors, Lesniak, Schubert, Flynn, Leslie, Sineni, Bergen, Young, and Schloss. And they are in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, as well as the Division of Infectious Disease in the Department of Internal Medicine and the Unit for Laboratory Medicine, all at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. And these are colleagues of Michelle's. That's right. And the globe is witnessing an epidemic surge in both numbers and in severity of Clostridioides difficile infections. This gram-positive anaerobic spore former that you probably hear in its abbreviated form called C. diff, as some of you might have heard it referred to by the press, has been identified as one of the causes of antibiotic-associated pseudomembranous colitis, which, again, is shorthanded down by the clinical world as CDI, and it's frequently associated, uh, typically subsequent the consumption of clindamycin, which is a bacteriostatic antibiotic, uh, given for the treatment of anaerobic infections. And recall that clindamycin binds to the 23S ribosomal RNA within the 50S subunit of the bacterial ribosome, where it impedes both assembly of the ribosome as well as translation. So this results in the inhibition of protein synthesis. And in fact, when you give clindamycin to an individual, that actually increases your likelihood if you're hospitalized and getting clindamycin, of contracting Hmm. hospital-acquired CDI by approximately fourfold. It's really pretty frightening. And it's it's an epidemic. 
in many U.S. hospitals because, again, this microbe is a spore former. So the normal routine cleaning, short of using, you know, really pretty fresh bleach, it's really hard to effectively sanitize uh, community areas. And it's now creeping into long-term care facilities as well as rehab centers. So again, this is not something to be uh, trifled with. But what caught my attention was the title of this paper. And it, it's good that Dr. Schloss is in charge of um, our ASM journals because he knows the importance of titles. And this one caught my attention. And the gut bacterial community potentiates Clostridioides difficile infection severity. Now, previous work has established that the microbiome of our intestine is known to interact with C. difficile during infection. But it's unclear whether specific members of our gut microbiota are associated with uh, variations in disease severity. So as our colleague Elio might offer, that's a story we're going to explore today on TWIM. <laughs> and here in what I think was a brilliant way to address this hypothesis, the authors asked how many members of the gut bacterial community could be possibly contributing to Clostridium difficile uh, disease severities. Now, or the, resilience, or resilience, or resilience. Yes, that that's no that. You know, both sides of of the coin. And mm -hmm. so, as I said to Vincent and Michelle when I was making the pitch to discuss this fascinating paper, this paper starts to get a little bit to mechanism of how it takes a village of microbes to alter or temper the severity of a CDI infection. And importantly, it matters who's living in your village of microbes as to the severity of the CDI you're actually going to experience if you happen to be a patient who contracts CDI. So before we get to the experiments and data, let's talk a little bit about CDI and how severity is defined. Remember, in clinical trials, whether they be in animals or in people, they measure outcomes. So we have to know what we are measuring in order to assess the value of the data that the authors are presenting. Now, C. diff colonization can be asymptomatic or develop into a raging infection where it rages in severity from a mild diarrhea to the really bad aspect of toxic megacolon, which is a term many of us are not familiar with. And it's a, an acute form of colonic distension. And it's characterized by a very dilated colon, hence the term megacolon, which is accompanied by abdominal distension or bloating. And sometimes it even results in substantial fever, abdominal pain, shock, sepsis, and even death. All of this rolls into a common phenotype that the authors roll into one word called morbund, which is an indication of the severity of clinical disease. Now, the IDSA, which is the Infectious Disease Society of America, and the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology have defined Clostridioides difficile infectious disease in terms of things you can measure easily, like white blood cell count. It has to be greater than 15,000 uh, white blood cells per cubic millimeter in a serum creatinine level greater than 1.5 milligrams per deciliter. Recall that your creatine level usually is an indicator of how well your kidneys are functioning. And C. diff, in addition to being a spore former, also has the ability, like most clostridia, to manage the production of toxins. And C. diff is no different. It produces two toxins, A and B, that um, experimental studies have shown to have direct influence on the renal duct of our kidney, leading to decreased kidney function, hence why creatine levels are such a remarkable indicator that you can easily measure. 
So when they roll it all up, they look at patient AIDS, white blood cell count, creatine levels, as well as the C. difficile ribotype and the toxin genes this microbe is carrying in order to define disease severity. And of course, However, why do this research? Ideally, you'd be able to, um, if somebody comes in, you'd be able to just screen their feces in this case and then predict whether they're at risk for developing very serious disease or m- more likely to be resilient and have mild disease. So they're looking and in fact, that's to add take a home diagnostic message. tool. Yep. That's their take-home message. If, if we get smart enough, will we be able to help the patient when they're admitted and we know we have to give them a bucket of antibiotics to help them, and we know we're going to perturb their gut, can we augment Mm. the good microbes to offset the bad microbes we may be manifesting by giving the antibiotic? Now, the way they did this study, it was done in notobiotic or germ-free mice. Here's where a mouse is born under aseptic conditions or without any presence of bacteria absent all intestinal flora. And then what the authors did is to provide to that germ-free animal a series of unique and complex microbial communities. They then allowed the mouse to mature, and then they infected the animal with a known strain of C. difficile, with a known toxin profile, and then they simply scored the severity of disease associated with the animals having these different intestinal compositions. Now, and, here, and these weren't just invented in the laboratory. They um, oh, had human donors. They and had 15 human donors. Yeah, and each person will have a different community, and that provided the experimental variation they were looking for. And they screened the humans based on their severity of disease score of whether or not they didn't have any disease or whether or not the human uh, stool sample they were collecting was indeed morbid. And so, again, you have 15 different combinations. And because all the mice are of the same, same genetic composition, born sterile, and then they acquire these different human stool samples from the 15 different, if you will, communities who are displaying various levels of CDI, they can carefully ask the question, who matters? How many matter? So then their first set of experiments, they allowed these graphs to establish themselves for two weeks. They first confirmed that the animals were C. diff negative by culture. So you take some poop from the animal and you ask the question, can you grow C. diff? This is a fairly easy and straightforward process. It's a selective and differential media. And C. diff likes to grow on the media that they use. Now, this takes us to their first figure. And since this is MBio, it's open source. So you can take a look at what they did. And they have some of the most beautiful figures I think I have seen for some of these complex stories. And if I and could interject, um, please. I know from being on uh, Nick Lesniak's thesis committee that he previously mm-hmm. um, earned a uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts in Industrial Design, So, and then he worked in design. And so he has got just a brilliant eye for mm. um, displaying complex ideas and data. His, his slides and his data are just gorgeous. Every element has a purpose. There's a lot of data in his slides, and it's some of the easiest complex data to digest. Kudos to Lesniak. He did a beautiful job. Now, to simplify this for an audio format, the fecal transplants that were given to these 15 animal groups bred true. And when they asked the question, you know, are the animals who got N1 got the same composition? The answer was yes. And they went to N2, they went to N3, all the way out to the morbid animals. And the microbial communities that they described were primarily composed of things you might anticipate out of a a human donor, Clostridia, Bacteroidea, Erysiplothricia, 
bacilli and gamma proteobacter. So the usual suspects out of our gut. However, the gut bacterial communities of each donor group of the mice harbored unique relative abundance distributions of these shared bacterial classes. So they counted, which was associated with the illness index affiliated with the human donor. Remember, these are human fecal samples going into a mouse that doesn't have any mouse floor. And it it was really a, a delightful figure to look at. Next, using this group of mice with effectively 15 different types of microbiota, they challenged them with C. diff. Now, typically, a mouse model of clostridial difficile disease requires pretreatment with an antibiotic like clindamycin. But of course, if you gave a mouse an antibiotic, that would perturb the microbiome. So you wouldn't be able to answer your question. So what they did, instead of giving the antibiotic, they just simply gave spores of C. diff to the animal. They gavaged it with a thousand spores of C. diff. And they asked the spores to effectively do their thing. Based on the population of donor, they then asked the question, what's going on in the gut of those animals. It, it, was, it was beautiful. And part of the brilliance here is they used a um, clinical isolate of C. difficile. So they knew oh, yes. it was potent. They weren't using a lab-trained. Adapted. Yeah, strain. The, and, and in fact, the, the strain, for those of you not getting access to the paper yet, is RTO-27, which is a known clinical isolate that causes substantial disease. It makes toxin. It's a really nasty flavor of C. difficile. So the mice were followed for 10 days post-challenge, and their stool was then collected and plated for C. difficile to determine the extent of the infection. And what did they find? Two mice were able to resist C. diff colonization. Both received their community from donor N1. And N in their nomenclature represents non-morbin, which may be attributed as, in their argument as the N1 family, may be attributed to experimental variation of how well the microbiome took. You know, it's it's hard to sort out the noise when you're dealing with, um, you know, billions of individuals. And again, you don't know who's doing what based on the mouse child that they're actually feeding. And again, by obtaining stool samples from individuals at different risks, they would be able to address the question, um, do your neighbors and their numbers matter in terms of the type of disease that you are going to develop? So they followed for 10 days. And they looked for colonization density, toxin production, and mortality. Three easily scorable outcomes. Do you still have C. diff? Are you making C. diff toxin? And are you alive or dead? Seven mice with communities from donors ranging from N1 to N5 were not colonized at detectable levels on the day after C. diff challenge, but they were infected by the end of the experiment. So, you know, there's something going on. C. diff is a is a robust competitor. And as Michelle pointed out, it's important that they're using a clinically relevant strain of C. diff in these challenge experiments. In the mice that received the fecal sample from community donors that they identified based on their clinical indicators as morbund, they the mice succumbed to the infection, and these mice themselves became very ill or morbid within three days post C. diff challenge. And Once can, I the just, C. can I just interject Please. and just remind the, the listeners, the mice are genetically identical. The C. diff challenge strain is the same, and yet they got very distinct differences depending on what the composition mm-hmm. of their gut microbiome was. It's just amazing. It, 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 you know, this, again, this is such a, 
a beautiful set of, and if you haven't taken a peek, look at figure two in the color profile and how he begins to lay out what's actually going on in these animals. The upper panel is the day after the challenge, and you can see how well C. diff is in grafting. And this, the lower panel is day 10, and you can see all the moribund animals are now deceased yeah. uh, that got the moribund C. diff profile. They're all dead. So you don't want a moribund microbiome if you're going into the hospital. I mean, it's it's bad news bear time. And it's really quite remarkable how clean the data were able to present. And I think it owes to the fact of how they're setting up to test their hypothesis. They started with a clean system. They had clear delineations based on clinical markers of disease of the microbiome they harvested from the human that they then put into the mouse. The mouse, because it was genetically identified, they had enough replicants in order to see the event. And and what made this so convincing is that the um, when they did, say, three different mice um, with feces from the same donor, the um, C. diff scores um, really clustered very tightly. Mm. Oh, yeah. And, and different, now, different from another donor. So, And again, they're having markers that they can easily measure – and get a number for it. So panel A of their third figure asks a very straightforward question. Is the C. diff making toxin? And you can see when looking at each group of the, each group of mice, they observed a range of toxin activities for both the morbid and non-morbid mice. And non-morbid mice with communities from donors N2 and N5 through N9 had comparable toxin activity to the morbid mice at two days post-challenge. Additionally, not all the morbid mice had toxin activity detected in their stool. So what this tells you is that the, your neighbors are helping you resist the toxic effects produced by the C. diff toxin. So the neighborhood community that you're living in is actually doing good things. Next, they examine cecal tissue for histological uh, pathologic damage. Morbid mice had higher levels of epithelial damage, tissue edema, and edema is a fancy word which means excess fluid that's trapped in the tissue, and then, of course, inflammation, which was similar to previous reported histopathic pathological findings for the pathology that is typically generated by this clinical isolate RT27 of C. diff. And as, as observed with the previous panel, the toxin activity, the morbid mice had higher histopathological scores than the non-morbid mice. However, unlike the toxin activity, all morbid mice had consistently higher histopathologic summary scores, meaning that the absence of the good neighbors weren't protecting you from the bad acting uh, effects of the toxin. The non-morbid mice representing group donors N1 through N9 had a range of tissue damage from none detected all the way to levels similar to the morbid mice, which was grouped, again, by community donor. And together, the toxin activity in the histopath pathologic score and morbidity showed variation across the donor groups, but were again, as Michelle pointed out early, largely consistent with each, within each donor group. So in thinking about the data, we see that the community of microbes you harbor at the time you're admitted to, if you will, the hospital for your introduction to C. diff can greatly alter the severity of the CDI, at least based on these CDI that the mouse experienced. Now onto the microbiology. And this six section of the paper was entitled, conveniently, Microbial Community Members Explain Variation in CDI Severity. And this was, again, a 
beautiful way to present the data. So again, they're asking straightforward questions. They simply ask, who's present on day zero, the day the animal was challenged with C. diff for the relationship to infection outcomes. And they used a statistical model called linear discriminant analysis effect size analysis to tease out the individual bacterial populations that might help them explain the severity of disease. So what they did is split the mice into groups by severity of level based on morbidity or 10 days post-infection histopathologic score for the non-morbid mice and asked what players of microbes were there. Their analysis revealed that bacterial operational taxonomic units. So they were all doing this via sequencing. They didn't grow anything. They were doing OTUs or operational taxonomic units. They were significantly different at the time of challenge by the disease severity. And that's shown in figure 4A. The bad guys that you don't want in your gut for a bad outcome are, are things like mm-hmm. acromancia, bacteroides, clostridia, turkey bacteria. They're found more frequently in the mice that became morbid that were associated and they were associated at higher relative abundancies. The OTUs, um, anorogitarium, anorocloister, and murimonas were more abundant in the non morbid mice um, that would develop low intestinal injury. And to understand the role of toxin activity in disease severity, they again applied the same technique of LEFSE, as they abbreviate, or linear discriminant analysis. It's a t- bit of a tongue twister. Uh, effect size analysis on on these organisms uh, between uh, the time of challenge to see if they could explain the differences. And they did that in panel 4B. An OTU that really struck them as sticking out was associated with bacteroides, the operational taxonomic unit, specifically number seven, which was associated with the presence of toxin and it was also associated with more um, the morbid phenotype. And similarly, OTUs, enteral cloister, and murimonas were associated with no detectable toxin. So those are the two microbes you want in your gut <laughs> if you're going to go to the hospital for antibiotic therapy. Um, they then tested for correlations between the endpoint or 10 days post-infection and the endpoint relative abundances of bacteroides OTU-17 was positively correlated with the histopathologic score as its uh, day zero relative abundance did with uh, disease severity. And between figure four and figure five, they really lay out the good guys and the bad guys using a mean value of around five. And they color code their data So it's very easy to discriminate the good guys from the bad guys. And the way the curve is um, illustrated, figure five, um, they have the toxin activity odds ratio. And you can just follow the blue dots that they have on their figure. And you can see the ones that you don't want and the ones that have significant toxin activity and the morbidity odd ratio, mm-hmm. the good guys are bifidobacter and some clostridia. There are good clostridia in addition to bad clostridia. And so the bacterial members in the last bit of panel five, uh, panel C, the bacterial members are grouped by their uh, operational taxonomic unit. And the prediction if the mice would have a higher or lower score of histopathology. And remember, it's the histopathology that determines whether or not you're going to develop toxic megacolon, how badly that toxin is denuding the colon and causing all that pathology. And you can see 
the high histopathologic odds ratio, once it goes above one, tells you you're going to have substantial disease. Below one, you're not going to have it. And rather than go through a list of organisms I'll butcher in pronunciation, I'll let you take a look at the figure. So in summary, these authors have walked us through this beautiful challenge experiment where mice were colonized with different human fecal communities, and then they were challenged with a clinically relevant strain of C. difficile. And they demonstrated that variation members of our gut microbiome can infect C. difficile infection disease severity. This was found to be dependent on the gut bacteria relative abundancies. So again, your neighbors and how many are there are important in reflecting whether or not you're going to get this bad histopathologic outcome of your cecal tissue and maybe potentially um, mortality. Their analysis revealed populations of anaerobes, and we know the anaerobe guts in its acromancia, anaerobe, uh, Anaeroterogenium, Blothia, <laughs> Anaerocloister, Lactoinfactor, and Monoglobus were more abundant in the microbiome of non morbid mice that had this lower histopathologic score. The bad actors or the group of bacteria that were associated with the higher histopathological score were members of the indigenous gut community. And as you can imagine, they often bloom because they often harbor antibiotic resistance. These are things like Bacteroides, Anaerococcus, and Klebsiella. And they, of course, are notoriously antibiotic resistant. And so they're going to bloom in the gut regardless of giving them clindamycin. And the clindamycin is taking out all the good guys. So it, it, it really recapitulates much of what we've been um, thinking about over over much of our trying to puzzle our way through CDI cases for the last 20 to 30 years. So I believe their principal finding was that the misfortune of C. diff colonization with its resultant intestinal damage is a disruption of the balance of all the activities in our gut. And the last line of their paper should cause us all to rethink our approach to diagnostic microbiology and that the treatment of the microbiome at the time of CDI diagnosis. We, we have to know who's there in order to figure out, could we supplement the good guys to uh, effectively prevent some of this histopathology from developing? So I found this to be a wonderful paper. It's really exciting. I also appreciated that they, in their discussion, they considered their findings in the um, context of the damage response framework that Arturo Casadevall and Lisan mm -hmm. Porofsky um, have put forth, um, mm -hmm. where it's not just if you get this bug, you're going to get this disease. We know it's much more complicated, and here they show that beautifully. There are different host factors. There are, um, even if the you're exposed to the same bug. It's not only the host um, response, but also the microbial community that will determine the outcome. So, Michael, what's the actionable material? Is this going to be able to predict who's going to have a bad outcome, or can we use it to treat people? Initially, I think with the advent of next-gen sequencing dropping like a stone in price, um, I think when people have an indication of developing CDI disease, they're going to look to see the balance mm -hmm. and maybe be able to provide a, a probiotic uh, solution. Remember, right now, one of the strongest treatment modalities for CDI that doesn't respond to antibiotics is, of course, a stool transplant, mm -hmm. where they take stool from a donor that has the good bugs and then provide it to an individual after they've sterilized your colon with really nasty suite of antibiotics. And then they hope that the new microbiome from the transplant actually will overtake and be able to displace the CDI. And so I think when anyone goes in and is going to be subjected to some of these truly broad spectrum uh, antibiotics where they're going to take them for long periods of time, 
they really have to worry about the players in their gut and whether or not you're going to have an adverse consequence. So I think, you know, upon entry into the hospital, in probably in five to 10 years, we're going to see people uh, give a stool sample, figure out who's down there mm. and adapt accordingly. And I think that's where they may be going with this. Michelle, do you have any insights since you've been to many more seminars? Than us? <laughs> I do, but also the, um, the organizations that bank uh, fecal samples for use in um, fecal transplants can use this information to screen um, their mm-hmm. donors and then um, identify donors who c- might be especially um, protective for someone at risk of C. diff. So lots lots to learn, lots of basic science to learn as well, but application. And, and actually, that's um, what Nick Lesniak is, is really focused on. So as I mentioned, he started out in industrial design and was working um, in as a design engineer for General Motors when he himself uh, began to develop um, inflammatory bowel disease. So he got quite interested in um, that problem as a, a public health problem and a personal problem. And that motivated him to actually um, come back to the University of Michigan and get a bachelor's degree, a second bachelor's degree in cellular and molecular biology. And while he did, he worked um, on an honors thesis um, looking at uh, vitamin B12 trafficking using C. elegans as a genetic model system. So then he had this really great foundation in biology, molecular genetics, biochemistry, so he uh, continued on then as a PhD student, now with Pat Schloss. And this paper is actually a collaboration between the scientists in Pat Schloss Labs and also uh, Vince Young's lab. So Vince is a physician scientist and has great um, knowledge and access to clinical samples. And then Pat's background is actually as an engineer, and he's a great bioinformatic specialist and has written a number of open source software packages that are now widely used for data processing of complex information like this data or microbial communities in different places. So Nick says that um, he especially appreciated during this project during yeah, this, his uh, thesis work, the contributions of Caitlin Flynn, who was a postdoc in the lab at the time, and she helped him kind of make the transition from being an undergraduate researcher to an independent scientist. And he also, and she also, Caitlin Flynn, also helped him develop this set of experiments into a full story. And Caitlin Flynn um, is now at Sage Bio Networks as a senior program manager of scientific coordination and data management. Another key con- contributor was um, Alexander Schubert, who designed and ran the key mouse experiments. And um, Alex is now a staff scientist at the FDA in the Division of Microbiology Devices in the Office of In Vitro Diagnostics and Radiological Health. So people from, from this group are able to go on and imp- apply their knowledge in many different ways. So what Nick's overall goal is, um, is to develop ways to understand and manage disease to improve the lives of those that have chronic disease, in particular, um, inflammatory bowel disease and the like. So currently, that's um, his focus. But in the long term, he wants to teach the next generation of scientists. Um, In particular, he'd like to work at a community college to make sure that science is inclusive. And he's not just talking the talk. He actually has been quite active and a real leader um, at our university and is member of a steering committee at our in our department um, for the what we call the Let's Talk Conversation Series, which invites people to get together and just um, talk safely about um, differences and developing new perspectives. He's also been um, the Diversity, Inclusivity, and Equity Committee member. He has um, been an instructor for Software Carpentry, a program to teach bioinformatics to people of all levels um, that Pat Schloss leads with the help of his trainees. He's also um, been a volunteer with on um, DNA Day, which teaches um, mm-hmm. hands-on lessons in DNA biology to uh, local high school students. He's also been a big brother, big sister, and um, has earned certificates in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and also teaching um, to diverse and inclusive audiences. So he is um, an amazing um, individual. He's made some really important contributions, not only in the lab, but also um, in our research community. His outside interests include um, 
watching as his infant daughter learns to explore the world. He said she's, oh my. she's already so curious and inquisitive, and it's, mm-hmm. um, he enjoys watching her and being a part of that journey. So in terms of advice for more ju- junior colleagues, he says, ask yourself why. It's helpful to remind ourselves of the outcome of an, ex- of an experiment, the reason for a figure, the focus of a paragraph, the motivation for the thesis. And many of these things and more, we can easily get lost in the details of the controls or in life in general. But if we continue to remind ourselves of our goals, we can um, continue to uh, refine and maintain our focus. So that is Nick Lesniak's story. And um, he has published two MBIO papers from his thesis uh, this summer, as well as a number of other uh, great papers. And so keep an eye out for him. He's, uh, he's got a great uh, future ahead. Hmm. Nice. Very good advice from him. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Ask yourself why. Right. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, Michael. I have one email for you from Adam, who writes, Greetings, fellow eukaryotes. I really enjoyed your recent coverage of the paper on bacterial cell wall shedding from Ariane Briegel and Dennis Clayson last week. I'm currently working on a project involving bacillus Phage V29 in Ethan Garner's lab at Harvard. So I have been thinking about this paper constantly since it came out. There's something you missed, though. At almost the same time the paper was published, Martin Lesner's group posted a preprint entitled Gram-Positive Bacteria Evade Phage Predation Through Endolysin-Mediated L-Form Conversion. In addition to confirming the existence of the effect by observing it in two other species, Listeria monocytogenes and Enterococcus fecalis, they specifically addressed the question of whether this would happen in natural environments. Enterococcus is a cause of urinary tract infections, and it turns out urine is osmoprotective. They directly show that cell wall loss can happen in human urine. Very cool, though disappointing for the prospects of using phage therapy on that particular bug. Mm. I remember asking you, Michael, yeah. what's going to be osmoprotective? And now it turns out urine is osmoprotective. Who knew? Who knew? All right, continuing, there's also an interesting disagreement about phage lysins. As you mentioned, the Briegel-Clayson paper claimed that lysins do not drive cell wall loss because they could not observe it when adding filtered lysate directly to cells. The Lesner paper, on the other hand, manufactured highly purified lysins and was able to demonstrate that they could induce cell wall loss. It is unclear to me which is more relevant. At first, the lysate sounds like a much more natural test of physiological conditions. However, in a natural phage infection on a solid surface, the local concentration of lysins diffusing to the neighbor of a phage-infected cell is presumably much higher than the concentration of lysins well mixed in liquid culture. Finally, in your discussion, you attribute the cell wall loss to selection, but under the osmoprotective conditions, the cell wall loss is rapid, happens in most cells, and is reversible, none of which is what you would expect from phage resistance by selection, like, say, having a mutation in the receptor the phage binds to. Figure 1A of Lesnar, for instance, they point out individual cells making the transition. Something else is going on here, whether it's just the action of the license or a more sophisticated response driven by the bacteria themselves. Uh, I would vote for the last one. More sophisticated response <laughs> driven by the bacteria themselves. Bacteria are just so much more clever than humans. And it sounds like Adam is on it. He is thinking uh-huh. hard about this in Ethan Garner's lab. And uh, yeah. yeah, thank you for sharing your insights. It's very good. Very good stuff. That's TWIM271. Show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIM if you want to send a question or comment like Adam did. Lovely. We love it. Or just say hi, TWIM at microbe.tv. If you enjoy our work, consider supporting us financially. We need your support. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Michelle Swanson's at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. And Michael Schmitz at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.